Check one, two, or is this thing working? Jeff, are you on? I think so. Check, check. All right, Sierra, we're looking good. Well, we're looking good. Stock market's not. Bond market's not. Inflation's hot. Hang in there, everybody. Let's get this show started. Jeffrey Anderson, CFA. Good to see you again, sir. You too. All right. Well, we're back here on the Presidio Perspective. And uh, we are recording this a uh, few days in advance of when you're viewing it. It's uh, Thursday. And this morning, we had some pretty troubling news um, as far as inflation coming in a lot hotter than expected. So, of course, you look at the markets and they are just way down. Wait a minute. <laughs> what is happening? The markets are soaring after crashing earlier this morning and going on quite a wild ride. So uh, I'd love for you to enlighten us about what's going on there. So let's uh, just segue, talk about the show a little bit. So I want to understand, I want to hear your perspective on what's happening in the market, um, why it's going up with um, this news coming in, which historically has sent it down and sent it down this morning. And um, I'm sure a lot of investors are trying to make sense of it. So hopefully you can help us with that. And then we want to kind of take an overall perspective, you know, lessons from the past during times like this, of course, always helpful. And uh, before making decisions to kind of see what our opportunities are, what our threats are, what are the shoulda, coulda, what is we're going to be saying about next year. And then um, asset allocation matters. Let's talk about that a little bit. But Right. So what's happening today? Well, to quote my favorite New York Yankee, Yogi Berra, it uh, feels like deja vu all over again. Oh, I bet you remember watching him as a kid <laughs> and just. <laughs> right, was he your childhood? <laughs> yeah. You were in your second job watching Yogi Berra, <laughs> quoting him around the office. Second second <laughs> marriage, third child. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Your kids love that guy. <laughs> um, so, okay. Deja vu all over again. So, what's happening? Well, we've been talking about inflation interest rates now for months. Yeah. And here we are again. Happens to be Thursday. We're recording this, and CPI data, data came out for the previous month. So, so let's just put this in perspective. Um, it's all about inflation. We've been talking about that a lot, and so we've said those words over and over on the show. Um, so we're watching inflation very closely. The Fed is acting hawkish, raising rates, punishing the economy. You're going to feel pain. Your stocks are down, bonds are down, people are going to lose their job, your house is going to go down in value, and you're going to experience some pain. Businesses are going to experience some pain until we get inflation under control. And so what we've all been waiting for, crossing our fingers, holding our breath, is for that inflation reading to say it's peaking, it's breaking, it's coming down. And so the Fed could then pause their aggressive movements. And we know after the pause, there's some period and before the years a pivot which would seemingly be very good for both stock and bond markets right so we're watching inflation closely inflation comes in where 8.2 expected to be what about eight one eight two eight three can't remember exactly the number because eight one was like was it eight one yeah. so it came in a little bit higher um but the market had already been down for six days prior meaning we talk about it. expectations are really everything, right? We had had CPI data peaking north of nine a few months ago, been in the eights. We've been having this data. We know we, every month we get CPI data, and the market tends to get ahead of itself, and the expectations are market moves up with the anticipation that inflation will be down. The, the pivot that we talk about with the Fed would be less hawkish. Maybe interest rates won't be that aggressive in terms of uh, the path. <clears throat> and, and then stocks would react favorably, as you said. But that didn't happen. We had all these false starts. And so we talked about this a couple of days ago, which was the expectations coming into this one seemed to be a lot less rosy than they were before. Stock was down. Stock markets, bond markets were down for six days, at okay. least the stock market. Okay. So what we've been seeing is the market's been hopeful, right? And so going into these readings, gave up a little bit of hope. They're hoping, right? And so what we've seen in the past is leading up to the inflation print, they've been a little bit more positive and you've seen some positive runway and inflation comes in high and they give it all back. Right. We saw a little bit different this time. Right. We saw that we have lost hope. We are not expecting good news, right? We're hoping for not worse worse news or whatever it is, meaning, you know, inflation's still hot and 
people are still buying stuff and the Fed's going to be uh, continue to be aggressive um, and raising rates. So that was different. But then what happened today? Wow. So uh, immediately, right? So the, the print comes out before markets open. Right. And futures markets way down. Way down. And uh, the markets open down, not as bad as the futures market, which is kind of good to see. Right. But they're still down. I mean, 2%, I think, on most major ind- indices. Right. A little bit more maybe on some for a bit. Yeah. And then here we are, kind of midday trading today on Thursday, and we'll see. It's a wild ride. You know, who knows where we end up, but the markets are up 2 3%, depending right. on where you're looking. And that reversal from how down we were to where we may close could be the biggest reversal in years. And, and again, we're not going to make, um, uh, you know, investment decisions on one day. But I think, again, it comes back to expectations. Everything is forward-looking. Everything, as we said, was very negative. Um, coming into this print inflation is still running high i think everybody now can, thinks can you tell us why it was down and now it's up why the market was down yeah well <clears throat> a couple things happened one remember you've got a lot of day traders involved you've got a lot of algorithmic trading you've got big hedge funds cmas these things futures markets so what do they do they jump on this data they hit the the bid knock it down and then they turn around and they buy it back and it's noise. A lot of it is noise, but it's really based off expectations. But what happened after that? We're kicking off earnings season, Q3 earnings, starting this week. It's going to continue right through the end of October. And, you know, the Amazons, Microsofts, the big companies, Apples, they're going to report at the end of the month. But right now, it's starting off with. Um, Blackstone reported today, and the banks are starting to report. And JP Morgan's going to report on Friday. And there was just some commentary that came out. It's basically really expectations were hey, okay, yeah, it was bad, but everybody now is starting to price in the fact that inflation is um, not going to go down that quickly. But what's going on with the Fed? What happened today was, and you'd think this would be negative, if I were to tell you without looking at the market and say, Remember we talked about inflation, the trajectory of interest rates, and how in the yeah. beginning of the year it was somewhat benign compared to what it is now. We were talking about 2 or 3% by the end of the year. And then we were mid threes, and then we were four. And right now we're already at 3%, right? We don't have a Fed meeting in November, so because you've got midterm elections, we should probably talk about that a little bit today. Yeah, okay. Um, and then you're going to have a Fed meeting in December, um, <clears throat> and then you're going to have one in um I'm sorry, you didn't have one in October, but you can have one in November and December. So now we're talking another 150 basis points probably being priced in, 75 basis points in November, which was kind of now a foregone conclusion. But now December was going to be 50 basis points, and now there's a two-thirds chance of a 75 basis point. So if I were to tell you that and keep telling you that inflation is sticky and it's services inflation is going up. Everything's going down. Everything's going down. But And it did initially. Right. But where you're going is a function of where you've been. And so when the markets were down, maybe they were a little bit too pessimistic, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I thought that was interesting in the Wall Street Journal. They said, you know, all these prints and all these headlines about inflation and employment and mortgage rates at 6.9. And then there was one little piece that's like, hey, why is the stock market up? Because you wouldn't think it would be up in some kind of environment like that. Well, there's a couple things. One, they were weak coming into it. Yeah. And, and the expectations were low. And so it came in. It wasn't nine. If it was nine, it'd be a different story. So it was already week coming in. Expectations were dour. Came in um, better than expected, so to speak. And the market had a bit of a lift. Um, and then secondly, getting back to, I remember you talking about this way back in 2021. In 2020, when we were talking about how bad news is good news. Yeah. Right? So bad economic news is what? employment's too strong. That's actually kind of bad news because that means labor strong. That means labor wages are up. And over July and August, wages were up 6.7%, which by the way, we should bring in one other interesting piece. There's there's a, some good news out there, which was Social Security, COLA adjustments. Yeah. Getting 8.7 in 2023. Okay. I think we should mention that. But yeah. anyway, um, we're getting to that point where the Fed clearly wants the economy to slow. They need labor wage push inflation to slow. How do they do that? 
with their crude tools, with interest rates. They bring down economic activity by raising rates, right? So, yeah. okay, they're going to raise rates. But what's happening? The Fed is saying our neutral rate, the rate they feel comfortable with unemployment is about 4%. We got to 35 They're like, ah, that's, a, that's too hot. So slowing economy by raising rates, and you're starting to see expectations now. The, the companies that have reported, they haven't been great. They've been losing money, or they're worse than they were the quarter compared to in 2021, or the quarter in 2000, or, or the second quarter. But the expectations were for worse. And remember, it's expectations. It's yeah. like you look at it, you go, okay, Blackstone's up 4% today. And Blackstone's a big money manager with over a trillion dollars. <clears throat> AUM went down, profit went down. But guess what? It wasn't worse than they thought. So, and, yeah, I mean, you're hitting on a lot here. So um, so we'll, we'll come back in to what happened today. But what you're talking about this year, essentially, is this complete reversal than what we saw in the last couple of years. Right. Right. So if you think of 2020, um, <coughs> obviously – really challenging year markets were crashing we had a pandemic and we had unemployment you know going through the roof and worse since worst unemployment rating since the great depression right right um and so you kind of look at that and you're like oh my gosh how do we get people to work kind of reminds me of an old seinfeld episode <laughs> yeah i think it was like whether the coffee was hot enough or like you know kramer got burned by some hot coffee and uh you know, it's like, wasn't coffee supposed to be hot? It's like, well, not that hot. <laughs> it's like, isn't it good to have a strong labor market? Well, not that strong. Not that strong. Not that strong, <laughs> right? Um, so here it is. All the focus and the Fed, really, uh, and the federal government doing everything they could to get businesses to hire people, to pay people, to, and then they pay people. They yeah. said, if you don't have a job, we'll pay you. Right. We're basically a socialist state. Um and then that, and then it was too much, right? right? And then now it's like, oh, the coffee's too hot, yeah. You know? And so now it's like, well, we got to cool it off a little bit. Too many people are working. We got to cool it off, yeah. So they're doing the opposite procedures to try to get, you know. So anyway, this is all quite a gimmick for us long-term investors, right? I mean, we really look through this noise. Um, you know, it's always served us well in the past to look through these things. I mean, especially twenty twenty. Uh, you know, best thing you could have done was nothing for the most part. I mean, there was definitely some opportunities and rebalancing, but um, yeah, getting out in those bad times obviously is a non-starter. So here we are, we've had a brutal year and you know, it's kind of the cat hanging in there, right? Because right. we know that that's our job and what to do. Um, so, you know, talking about what's happening today, I think it's just helpful because I think a lot of investors are scratching their head, not to go and act on that information, but if we can help offer the perspective and inform. And so I think you're bringing up a lot of good points here. Right. One of the things you said is these algorithmic traders, and we've talked about that on the show too. And we've talked about the algorithm that comes into the price of the overall stock market, but individual companies, right? There's bottom up on the individual companies and there's a whole market sentiment. And there's all of these macro factors that determine, you know, what, what multiple of earnings and what my confidence are in those earnings, my projections of earnings, how far out in the future and the discount rate. And so that algorithm has a bunch of numbers in it. And the sensitivity analysis of when you change one of those numbers, right, is like, oh, well, if inflation's this, that's that's a higher discount rate on future cash flows. Right. It also infers a uh, more aggressive rate hike, which is going to eat away at earnings, right, as borrowing costs go up. Uh, tampons down demand so sales could go down so the whole algorithm gets repriced when you get a new number so there's this immediate up and down that you kind of see when you have these events elections are one of those times too right, right? and so you have this immediate reaction um, but I think also what you were saying is look we were really negative going into it so although we changed the number then here we are so I think a lot of traders, institutional investors, individual investors are asking themselves, you know, during this time is the bottom in. Right. Now we're never going to call that on the show because that's just a fool's errand, right? Because there's so many different events that could happen, right? But I think when you see these, then the debate is, is this a bear market rally? And we don't know, you know, we don't know. But I think also one of the things that I think of is yes, this market changed the number is hard, it was disappointing. Okay, so this is bad, but then it's, oh wait, there's not a Fed meeting this month. And usually we'd have some immediate price action, but 
what I think people are asking is, well, is this the peak, you know? And so has this really, are they looking at this inflation data and although it did not come down lower, is this the sign of the top? And we're gonna get more inflation data before the next Fed meeting, right? Right. So I think that's what the market digested, right? Is on top of this and you have the 30 day cycle of all of those companies reporting earnings, how strong that is, those that are reporting, the demand is very strong, airline stocks, energy, financials are all going very well today, right? So you're gonna have that, um, you're gonna have that much more data. So I think that's what the market is pricing in and maybe restored some hope, right? That that had all been lost the week leading up until today. Right, and the capital markets, when I say capital markets, I mean bonds and stocks. I mean, it. it um use Ron's term yesterday, um, a bore's a vacuum, which is you got to have something to focus on. And so it's a good point not having the uh, Fed meeting right now so we can focus on what earnings and inflation. Yeah. Now, could we have inflation go higher next month? Some really smart people are thinking that inflation may take a little bit higher. Why? Um, the CPI data we got reflected oil that was in the 80s. Now we got oil in the 90s. We've got um, house prices have not come down. We could probably talk about that very briefly about the state of the housing market. We could probably do that in 60 seconds. But um, the the uh, rents, which are a huge component of CPI, have a lag effect, right? And they're going to catch up with house prices. And so that's going to put um, a, a kind of a floor, maybe upward pressure in the meantime. But when I look at it, and again, not an economist, we're not making Bless you, calls on... on um, where CPI is going, but in general, we did, we got to 9.3 on a, on a vertical line, and then we came down, and we're kind of just plodding along, and I think people are getting more and more comfortable, not necessarily where inflation's going, so to speak, like, could it go to 10, is it going to 6, but more, more to the point, I think, that the Fed is, people realize, the Fed is now committed. I mean, people realize that the Fed is actually committed to inflation. If you thought that they weren't, and what did people say six months ago, all the smart people, the Fed's behind the curve, they don't know what they're doing, and now we've got them saying they're being too aggressive, so they can't win. Well, it's also just what gets printed out there in the news media, right? And we've got you, some good charts always, or some good... Yeah. Uh, but you've always had both sides out there, and it's just kind of what we they decide to put in front of us is always going to be the critique. Right. It's not people saying, hey, things are good. You're doing a good job. You're getting inflation under control. Keep going and things are going to be OK. You're never going to hear that in the news. No, ever. And but so, the pivot, let's just let's end on this um, to tie it back in. What are we and, talking Unless about? it's the absolute top. Right. That's when they'll say, go all in. Yeah. Literally. And I think we're going to share that in a second here. Yeah, I think so. But did you want to do one more point? Uh, go ahead. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to it later. No, I got to move on. I got to move on. OK, we'll move on. But I just wanted to say the one thing that I think is really important is that um, the comparisons, right? And so we're comparing to last year, right? Or we're comparing to last quarter. So that's what when companies report, you know, they're looking at year over year and they're going to use your projections over the next year. And so like when 2020 happened, everything was bad, but everybody kind of knew it was going to be bad. So we shrugged off bad news, right? Right. Um, and then whatever was reported, many companies just didn't report, but um, whatever was reported was a very low number. Right. And so when 2021 was happening, I mean, the record growth was astounding. And it was because you had all this pent up demand, you had all this free money. And so and you may have pulled some demand forward too. It, yep. Pulled demand forward, um, pulled it back, you know. From, so it made the, the comparisons easy. I think that's the comparisons going, right? were easy. Right. And then now they're a lot harder they're much harder right because we have to go live up to that fake number that we had in 2021 that was propped right. up by pent-up demand and low interest rates and a, and a um and a bad global supply chain and so some of those issues still persist and uh so but now we're creating the new comparisons right so when we look out as investors i think that's kind of what you're saying is you know they're still looking at um, you know, what is the future hold for the comparisons that we're making last quarter, this quarter, and where we're going to go from here? That's always an important part of right. why markets usually see brighter times after the bad times, right? And, right. and it's not the time to get out when things are bad. It's usually the time to buy. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to talk about how old you're going to enjoy this one. Um, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. nobody talked about macro. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was, there was Greenspan, the Fed, um, 
like there is now, but not every portfolio manager was a had a macro hat to put on. And and sometimes you could argue that that's just going to get you into trouble. Right. If you get scared into making decisions based on where you think the economy is going, it's probably not a good way to run a portfolio. You got to get back to kind of just It's not. It's not a good way. If you're a if you're a manager and you're Peter Lynch or Warren Buffett, you don't look at macro. No. Right? If you, you are, use them as a guide post though. Maybe, but I think that's more our job. You right. know, I think that's our job to help with asset allocation. Um, which matters. I'm going to segue there. I mean, yeah. asset allocation matters. And, you know, that's kind of like if you look at the S&P 500 today. I just happen to have it up. And so, you know, where, where are our exposures? Where are our top sectors that we're allocating to if we are investing, say, in an S&P 500 index fund? So if you had just the S&P index fund, uh, I probably not much of a surprise, but 23% quarter of it, almost a fifth of it to a quarter of it is technology. Yeah, information right? technology. Yep. Right. And we all know and that how doesn't that's... include Tesla and Amazon. Right. Tesla's an automaker. Yeah. Uh, Amazon and Apple are actually, uh, uh, well, consumer discretionary, consumer um, uh, communication services. Communication. People think of so that Apple doesn't include tech. Amazon, right. Apple, which is the first and the third largest company, right, in the country. So we're getting north of 35%. <laughs> you know, it's our large cap growth, whatever. Right. But anyway, keep going. Then, so then what else? what would be second would be... What are we lowest in? I'm going to ask you that. I'm going to ask you that. I guess energy and materials. That's a pretty good guess. Uh, the lowest would be utilities after uh-huh. basic materials. But utilities always been a small section. Yeah. But yes, you're absolutely right. It is basic materials and energy. And by the way... What has worked the best? What what has worked well in an inflationary environment? Yeah, those those two, right? right? So you talk about asset allocation. You're building portfolios. You're you're looking at the S and P five hundred. That's kind of your benchmark. But within it, there are certain sectors where a portfolio manager is going to overweight or underweight. I mean, I don't think it's going out on a limb to say that we are not in a bull market. That would not be going on a limb. I'm, no, okay. Um, and I would, I would love to hear somebody argue the counterpoint to that, but I wouldn't probably find anybody. Right. So probably everybody listen, listening right now is nodding their head, yeah, no kidding. So look, it's very easy to invest in a bull market because a rising tide lifts all boats, they say. And so whether you just bought any sector of, you know, and you market cap weighted to mostly these technology companies, strong communication services companies, um, retail, which is Amazon, um, then yeah, you did all right, you know, buying these, these sectors. And it didn't really matter what you owned. And so what I have found is um, about 10 out of 10 people that I talk to when we review their portfolios have no idea what they own. Right. Um, and it's okay. I mean, you don't get training uh, in school, which is why we teach retirement courses, but on tax, estate planning, you know, nothing. You know, somebody might tell you to buy a home when you're young and how to pay a mortgage and probably told you to pay it off at your 2% rate, unfortunately. Uh, so we get some, maybe some good advice, maybe some bad advice, but there's no training on how to invest in the stock market, right? And so you read these kind of articles and you kind of look at what's working in the 401k and what's not, and what do people do? They get out of what's not working and go and invest in the one that is. And, you know, it's a strategy to, to buy high and sell low. Um, well, right now it's really challenging. And so it just, in these markets, and they could persist for a while, uh, I would argue they will, it really matters what you own. And if anything, like get a review, a diagnostic, just understand what you are actually investing in. Because when I show people, this is what you're investing in. These are your concentrations in your portfolio. Uh, one person I was just talking to, uh, is, you know, high concentration to mid cap growth. You know, what is that? You know, it's the DocuSigns and the ARC stocks and, you know, the Shopify's or the everything that's gotten just taken to the woodshed, as you say. And if not, not to say you shouldn't have exposures to some of that stuff and that they're done and that they're not going to perform over 10 years. But what is it saying about the world? I mean, when you are look at your portfolio and where all your money is, that is should reflect a vision that you have, a, a conviction you have about the, the state of our economy, the future growth potential, where that growth is going to occur. You want to invest along those lines. 
and I find that there's a big disconnect to what people actually uh, think or feel is going to happen. Um, and I'm not talking about the market going up and down. The market's going to market, you know, but asset allocation matters. Where are your exposures? Do you have concentrations? Have you over concentrated your bets into one sector, which is maybe a long shot at this point of growth really restoring of, you know, having some long term secular bull market quickly being ushered back into uh, equity markets, right? Everyone's out of bonds, everyone's out of fixed income as this unloved asset class, you know, just like energy was, right? And um, it's really important to do your homework and understand how that works. People have no idea, they have no love for bonds. They're either all in on growth stocks or they're in cash. You know, and it's like, well, it's everything in between those that is actually gonna be the most important things for your portfolio from what I'm seeing and what you talk about. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and that's the thing that we always, you and I talk about weekly, um, how we see the world and does, does the portfolio fit our view of the world? Yeah. and and, and you ba rebalance along the, the edges, right? We're right. not going all in. And look, there's hedge funds that do, and some of them go bankrupt, and some of them make gazillions of dollars, and that's just not the game we want to play as long-term investors. Right. You know, But you have to have things that are working in different markets and different market environments and have an answer for what if. you know. And so what if there's a war? What if there's a deep recession? What if there's a shallow recession? What if there is low growth? What if the Fed pivots? and What's going to happen with your portfolio in those different events? What if inflation persists and we're okay with it? What if we get through this on the other edge and inflation drops and housing drops and you know fixed incomes challenged, credit markets are challenged? So there's a lot of what ifs, and you have to kind of look at your portfolio and say, are, am I comfortable with how I'm investing and going going to go through these potential rides? Because something's going to happen, and that's going to be your experience, and you're going to have an outcome based on how you're investing and you'd want to know what those potential outcomes are of the portfolio and what you're going to do when they happen. Right. Right. And so, you know, especially if you're nearing retirement, you're in retirement, obviously it matters. You're not just like, Oh yeah, cool. Give it another 10 years. I'll look at it then. I mean, it, this is your money and it yeah. kind of matters. So make sure you have a strategy that fits your uh, convictions to the extent that you have them. If you don't have any, like, get your playbook. Like, what are you going to do? It's a very volatile market right now. There's two pieces to that asset allocation story that uh, one that we we should probably finish on, yeah. which would be everything you just mentioned is is spot on. I agree, but it, when you have a view of the world, mm -hmm. right or wrong, it's good to have a a view of the world. But the problem then becomes a lot of investors, and I know this from professional investors too, which is then it's what's your concentration, what's your how much have you allocated to it, right? And so you can have a view of the world, you can have too much of it. Yeah, I'm just using an example. I know you hate gold. And we're not gonna. Gold. We're. <laughs> you like gold rings, yeah. But uh, but gold, for example, I remember in two thousand nine when we were printing all this money, and everybody said, you know, you want to own gold, you don't want to own the dollar, right? Right. And a friend of mine who's a very intelligent guy, he was an accountant, and he did all this great investing on the side, and he used to invest in bankruptcies, and he was very good at it. But he was convinced that it was gold that was going to save his economy, his, his portfolio, his, his portfolio. And he said, gold is, we're going to lose purchasing power and gold's going to go up tenfold. Well, what did he do? What, 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 what do you think I would do if you told me, and I'm the portfolio manager, hopefully that I've convinced you. You would have put 3% in gold. Uh, yeah. Three to five or something. Yeah. It's like, okay, went up tenfold. I've protected 50% of the purchasing power yeah. in the portfolio and you've got other stuff. Well, he put in 60%. Yeah. And lost 30. But he didn't just buy gold. He bought gold miners and got wiped out. So all yeah. the stuff he had done before... And his thinking was great, but then he just put too much of it in. Right. right? So talking about mid-cap growth, it worked well, but maybe you've got too much of it, and now you've got it at the wrong time. So now you, you're faced with two decisions, not just one. So that's really important stuff. But yeah. Finish on that. I do want to talk about... I, I just... Did, yeah, finishing on that and what I'm saying. So even if nothing comes of it, like, you know, doing this, doing this study uh, doesn't necessarily mean, like, I have to come in and change everything and do a bunch of stuff. If anything else information is going to help you decrease the fear. Uh, if you don't know what's happening, you don't know what you're investing on, and maybe head in the sand is the way that people like to deal with it. Typically, that's how we deal with financial issues like inflation, taxes, market crashes. We just right. pretend like they don't exist. But, um, you know, there is a point where you're going to reach your threshold, your pain tolerance, your risk tolerance, and you're going to probably do something foolish at that point. If you have information on your side and an understanding of what you're doing and your time horizon, then maybe you're going to make a lot better decision, at least if you're informed. So yeah. I would argue being informed is going to help you. All right. So we do need to keep the show moving along so uh, people can 
you know, go off and live more interesting lives and go do other stuff. But um, I do want to touch upon this article that I thought was really timely from Time Magazine, kind of on our theme of just like holding on for dear life. And that just kind of seems like what it's going through right now. Like we've had the pain, you know, we said at the beginning of the show, inflation's hot, stocks are down, bonds are down, real estate's about to roll over and unemployment's coming and we gotta hold on, right? Right, except that's from 2009 <laughs> and we are living it again. Isn't that interesting, right? What happened in March of 2009, if investors don't recall, I'm sure many do, but that was the absolute bottom of the stock market. I remember it acutely. Yeah, I, many people do. Um, and so, you know, when things are really bad, you know, I think it is a pertinent article for today because this is kind of what it feels like. Obviously, the economy is not like it was in March of 2009. But yeah, when things are really tough, it's typically the time to hold on for dear life and uh, make it through. And had you done that in March of 2009, um, that thread did not break and that bond built back pretty strong and you went on a pretty fantastic 10 year, 11 year, 12 year bull market, um, from March of 09. So holding on during these times, good article, maybe time should run a reprint. Yeah. We, we may see it again, but how often, you know, so this is great, Jeff, you found all these and sent them to us. So, uh, I thought it was great to bring on the show because you know, it's such a good reflection of like what we hear in the news. So this other Time Magazine special report, GetRich.com, right? Secrets of the New Silicon Valley. And it's all about the dot-coms, and it's all about getting rich. And here's your special report. And when did this one come out? That was uh, September 27th, 1999. So right about the peak of yep. the tech bull market, and we went to the tech wreck after that where the NASDAQ lost, what, like 90%? Yeah. So this was uh, not the time to get rich in the dot-coms. Um, so fast forward to July 29th, 2002. Yeah, will you ever be able to retire? Stocks plummeting, corporations in disarray, financial futures are in peril. Um, yeah, so what, telling retirees to go get a job. But again, this is just about a market low, um, and you saw about a 20% increase in stock market since this came out yep. right over that time period it looks like um well, stocks were incredibly cheap at that time right when that came out yeah absolutely um What's yeah fear fear sells right you have 2008 right october 13th 2008 the depths of the financial crisis you know you have these uh the new hard times uh coming out Taking a picture of depression, uh, depression. 2.0. And I don't know if that's an unemployment. Oh, it's free soup, so it's a bread line. Yeah, there you go. It was a bad economy, and things are tough, but these are typically the times where it's either right before it starts getting better or right as it's getting better, or if it's telling you to buy, it's right before it crashes, right? The great reckoning. Um, this is the moment changing the world. Right, here's the pandemic coming, what, what was this, Mar May 18th of 2020? Yep. The, the market had hit its bottom about a month prior to that, right? And so again, just telling you how bad everything is and what happened with your investments after this was a pretty phenomenal run. Home sweet home, we're going gaga over real estate. You know, this is just showing the, the sign of what's working and what you should do and how to make money. And Which was about a year from the top. And we we're already in that frothy environment so yeah what i get out of it with time magazine is fear sells and uh, do the opposite of what these these crazy headlines are or it's yeah it's not or, always or not it's not even do, do the, the opposite. opposite it's like you know when they're when they're talking about how bad things are that is usually the signs of the times right before they get better and if they're talking about how amazing things are, it's usually the sign right before things are getting Take worse, pause. Yeah. you know? And so whenever we're feeling this elation at the top or this depression at the bottom, take pause. I love that. It's good to just take pause, take a breath, get your playbook together, get your story down of what your thoughts and convictions are of the world over the next three, six, nine, twelve 12 months. And then the next five or 10 years before you make bad decisions, because whatever decisions you make, they're going to have a pretty big impact. Or what decisions you don't make. Make sure those doing nothing con decisions are still within your thinking and convictions of what your playbook says is going to happen over the next year and then for the long run, right? Right, and, and not making decisions or 
um, consciously deciding not to do something can can be good and it can be bad, but usually it's because you're frozen by fear. Yeah. And, and that's something obviously we want to avoid. All right. Well, um, we got about an hour to market close. We're still positive. So I think the show, we don't have to dive into how they crashed at the end of this show. I was kind of worried about that. Who knows? But hey, they're going to have more volatility. So investors out there, um, you know, be cautious. Don't get too excited on these up days. Don't get too down on the down days. We're going to have more of this volatility. Um, again, just know what's happening in your portfolio. We're going to get through this. Hang in there, right? Yep. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the show. Got value about our, our perspectives on what's happening in the market. And we'll always be here every couple of weeks letting you know what's going on. Jeff, D- Jeff Anderson, Dustin Tembrook here to help you with any of your portfolio needs. All right. Thanks, guys. Have Take a good care. One. I'm not